Thank you, everyone. Welcome. The time is now 6 p.m. And I'd like to call to order the Monday, October 25th, 2021 study session meeting of the Board of Education, October 25, 2021. We will start with the Pledge of Allegiance led by Jesse Flores, Director of Safety and Security. Thank you. We will now take roll. Isela, will you call roll, please? Governing Board Member Garcia? Present. Governing Board Member Gomez? Present. Governing Board Member Martinez? Present. Governing Board Member DeLeon? Present. Governing Board Member Guarenta? Present. We will now move on to the approval of the study session meeting agenda, October 25, 2021. May I get a motion? May I get a second? Board Member Gomez seconds. Thank you. Any questions or comments on this item? Hearing none with a motion by Board Member Martinez and a second by Board Member Gomez. Isela, will you call roll, please? Governing Board Member Garcia? Yes. Governing Board Member Gomez? Yes. Governing Board Member Martinez? Yes. Governing Board Member De Leon? Yes. Governing Board Member Cuarenta? Yes. Motion carries. Next up, um, the next item is public hearing. Persons wishing to address the board should fill out a blue card located on the table by the door and submit the card to the secretary. Speakers will be called in sequence during the hearing section, which is limited to each speaker to one presentation of three minutes. The board cannot engage in public discussion during this portion of the agenda. Staff will follow up and address the public inquiries if contact information is provided. Those who have a group concern are encouraged to select a spokesperson to address the board. Persons wishing to address the board on a specific agenda item at the time the item is under discussion are limited to three minutes each and will be called to speak following the staff comment and prior to the board's discussion and taking action. Isela, do we have any comments? I do not have any blue cards for this evening, President Cuarenta. Thank you, Isela. The next item of business is the superintendent's informational update. We will start with item 3.1, safety under COVID. Thank you, Board President Cuarenta. Board members, if you recall, uh, the board asked for us to provide you information on COVID safety information as well as the latest information we have. Before I turn it over to my colleagues for the presentation, I wanted to give you a brief update that shows the ever evolving nature of COVID. We know now that we will begin to get some direction regarding vaccinations for our five to 12 year old students. However, we expected last Thursday to get some indication and they're still working on it. So the presentation that you get today, even though it's the latest information, you already know that there will be an evolution as we go to the next phase, which will be a new vaccination drive for a new group. With that, we also opted to give you more than simply a presentation on safety. One of the benefits of having the type of district that we have is that we help each other. And as we were looking at our staff working incredibly hard to meet the demands of testing and vaccination, the idea came of our own group of students, one of our own, to help with the process. And tonight we are going to showcase to you that relationship and the great help that's brought to our staff and to our services. But we'll expand to provide you information on the career paths that our district offers. After all, we're an educational entity, so tonight as we give you information on safety, we will also celebrate one of our more efficient educational programs. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott Law to start our presentation on COVID safety practices. And please feel free at any time to let us know if there are questions and we'll address them. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Good evening, uh, Good evening, Madam President and board members, Superintendent Frutos. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit about some of our COVID safety uh, procedures we're, we're doing right now. So let's take a look at slide two, please. We are currently doing testing of both our students and our staff. Some of our staff, uh, staff is mandatorily um, testing and students have an opt-in testing option. We have just over 1,100 students that are tested each week. 
They're tested at school. Uh, the SHOT, the student health office technician, performs the test. It's a PCR test, so it's not a rapid test. It's high reliability, but with that comes a little bit of a time lag, so it's 24, 36 hours. They usually get the results. Uh, parents can opt in or opt out at any time. There's no obligation and it's free and everything else that's wonderful about that test. When the results do come in, they go multiple places. They go to the parents, they go to the district nurses, and they go to HR. Um, that way, we're really looking at that list every time it comes in, um, 4 a.m. in the morning and noon every day, we look at that list to look for any positives. If there are positives, then we start the contact tracing and we quarantine if we, if we need to. And I'll share a little bit more about how we get to quarantine or not later on in my presentation. Mr. Law, have yes. any of our parents opted out to have their child tested? We have had a few opt out, very, very few, a handful. Okay. And, and, and no reasons given, I, I would share if I had it, but, okay. but we, have about, we have 1,112 in currently and only three or four that have ever opted oh, out. Good, thank you. Yeah. Next slide, please. Our adult testing, our staff testing program is very similar. Um, I think what's worth noting is that we have 509 staff that are mandatorily being tested. Uh, this is in accordance with the state guidelines that they need to be tested weekly. We set up a different day of the week that they're tested. The students are tested on Wednesday. Um, staff is tested on Tuesday. They have an opportunity in the morning and they have an opportunity in the afternoon. Uh, and then we have a makeup day on Wednesday, which got cut off there. But on Wednesday, we have a makeup day. It's the same PFC, uh, PCR test. It's the same procedure. And it's also uh, administered by the shots at the site. The results are still 24, 36 hours and staff who has been vaccinated and have shared their vaccination uh, information with HR uh, are not tested. Uh, employees have the option to go to any of their own preferred medical uh, providers. Uh, some, some employees might want a different type of testing. That's fine. Uh, we have educated our employees that uh, LA Health won't accept home uh, rapid tests. So other than that, they can do it on their own if they would like to and submit to HR. Uh, results in this case are only sent to HR. Um, it's not sent back to the site. It's not sent to um, it's not sent to anybody other than HR. And positive results are are noted, and we do the contact tracing and quarantine if possible. It's the same same routine. I have a question, Mr. Sure, Dahl. for sure. From those staff members that are vaccinated, um, are, about how many of those still get tested? You know, because I'm, I'm imagining that they could get tested. If they wanted so to. we're not I'm going to share that in a couple slides okay. more but but we we're not quite ready to roll out uh, opt-in testing for the adults we're about two weeks away I think I think we're shooting for November um, the first week in November or the second week at the latest to have some opt-in testing for adults and I'll share that with you in a second here next slide please so we you know it is a burden uh, on the on the staff at the sites, it's a lot of extra work they have to do, and we've tried to make it as efficient as possible, and added some technology to help out, and preloaded all the information and all those things. But it still is a burden and takes time, and so we've offered some other um, ways of supporting the site. We have a district office every Wednesday. We've we've adopted a school, and we send staff out to the schools on Wednesday to help with the student testing and they stay through the duration of the testing and in most cases they're actually able to help with the mailing out of the of this test samples and on uh, Tuesdays and in Wednesdays we're doing the makeup testing here in the district for adults so on Tuesday at the sites and on Wednesdays back here at the district office for adults we have uh, people from uh, our medical assistant program our CTE program and I'm gonna share I'm gonna have them introduce themselves in one second and we're gonna do a demonstration for you but it's been a super nice partnership that we've been able to use our own CTE program to help out in this process. I think next slide now. All right, so I'm gonna have I'm gonna have these young ladies come and introduce themselves to you, and then I'm gonna be the brave soul that they're gonna test. So <laughs> you're gonna watch me give myself a test, but that way you kind of see what it really. And this is the exact same test that the adults and the students are doing. We'll demo it and later. Scott, as you yes. set them up and they introduce themselves, board members, if you remember, we have had, like every organization in the United States and everywhere, 
misconceptions that uh, swab goes very high up and that uh, folks cannot do it. We wanted to do a live one by our medical students so that you see exactly what it is. That way the board members can also answer the question. It really is just at the very tip, et cetera. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over for introductions and testing. And how often do you get a live demonstration? Right. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Jesenia Grano. Yeah. Good afternoon, my name is Susan Paragan. Okay, ladies, so you're gonna test me. Yes. Walk me through it, here we go. Um, I'll go ahead and start with the hand rubbing technique, because first of all, hand rubbing techniques is the most important part in COVID testing. So, you should get closer to the microphone so the people who are listening, they can. Sorry. Um, we're gonna start with the hand rubbing technique because I believe that um, as a medical assistant perform, uh, instructing someone to a uh, COVID test, the hand rubbing technique is really important. It's a really important technique in starting everything. So I am going to start off by first off introducing myself to the patient. You know, hi, my name is Susan Barragan. I'm gonna be your medical assistant today. So while I am introducing myself, I am also doing the hand rubbing technique. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, have hand sanitizer. Each step is counted as five seconds. So I'm going to start off by rubbing my hands together and making sure I'm actually um, talking to the patient. Why? Why do I talk to the patient? I talk to the patient to make them feel comfortable. Yes. First off, before having them instruct the, instructing me as myself to do the, uh, the COVID test. So I'm rubbing my hands and, you know, hi, how are you? My name is Susan Barragan. How's your day going? And we're making sure we're doing the steps uh, for five seconds, each step. Interlock my fingers with my fingers for five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. And then we do the same on the other hand. One, two, three, four, five. After that, we lock our fingers together and we rub against them. Why? Because we make sure we get every part of the hand, but in, in between the hand is where bacteria uh, gets in there the most. So we have to rub our hands together for five seconds. And then after that, we make sure we get this part of our hands too, and making sure we get our thumbs. Hmm. Why? Because in hand sanitizing, people forget their thumbs a lot. <laughs> so getting our thumbs is really important. And we also make sure we get our fingers, the top fingers, for five seconds, and then do it on the other side as well. After that, we also have to make sure we grab and sanitize our nails. Because nails, is, you know, a lot of stuff goes in there. So we do our nails for five seconds as well, and we do it on the other under hand. And then after that, just going all over your hands. And then after that, we can proceed with instructing them to do their COVID tests. Go ahead and give it to you. So after we're done sanitizing our hands, we make sure to put on our gloves just to get that extra safety for our, ourselves and the patient. Once we have our gloves on, we also want to sanitize that. Mm -hmm. It's a little faster way, but make sure you get everything, everything in between. And then we proceed to tell the patient if they would like to blow their nose because we want to uh, remove all that mucus because what we want in the test to collect is the cells of the wall of the nostrils. So would you like to blow your nose? <laughs> <laughs> After that, we or meanwhile they blow their nose, we can start preparing our material. I like to ask them for their name first, name and date of birth, before they go through that discomfort. Mm -hmm. So I would write down uh, your name. So may I have your name? Okay, and then I would write it down and your date of birth. 
Okay, and then I would write it there as well, and I would write it on the bottom sticker and place it on the tube. Then I will ask him to sanitize his hands for me as well. So may you mm -hmm. please sanitize your hands. I'll then open my test and get it ready. Now what I do is I open it from the, not the tip part, but the opposite, mm -hmm. so that they can grab it themselves. Mm. So I'll be opening it. Do I open it? Okay. Okay. <laughs> and I, uh, there's two swabs in here, but the one that we use is the thinner one just to make it less uncomfortable for them. Mm -hmm. So then I leave it like that and ask them to pull it and make sure to tell, the, to tell them that um, only touch inside the nostril and nowhere else because it could uh, uh, affect the test result of the test. So once the sticker is on there, I instruct them to insert as far as you can go in each nostril for five seconds or five complete circles mm -hmm. as far as you can go. After that, they can hand it to me, and then I do the rest of the thing. I put it in there, break it off, close it, put it in the bag where his name and date of birth is, and then I give it to, um, I just set it aside. And we are done. They are good to go. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, I do have a question. Yeah. Um, I noticed that the medical assistant gave the bottle sanitizer to, to, Mr. to Mr. Law, mm -hmm. or the patient, let's just put it. Um, it. Why is it given to the patient instead of the medical assistant just pouring a little on the hand instead of, because it, that means everybody's touching, isn't yeah, that correct? Yeah, it's usually a pump, so I just tell them to do it themselves. So I don't usually grab it, but right now I, I just grab it right now. Okay. But it's usually a pump, so um, it's in front of them and they just pump it themselves. Susan and Isenia, um, have any of our patients asked if there's a uh, alternative to the swab testing? Uh, I so heard far. that there is a vial that they could spit into. So far, this is the only test the that only they've one. been using, yeah, and they usually do it, and we ask them to do it themselves so they feel more comfortable performing the test. Okay, thank you. But how many do you do a day? I mean, that you guys, that you young ladies have been helping out with? It varies because we both have different times. Okay. Uh, when I do it, it's usually like seven people in the morning, seven people in the afternoon mm -hmm. on Tuesdays. And then this past Wednesday, it was about 20, 25, I think. Yeah. Well, we thank you very much for yes, helping out. You. Very good. You're a good sport, Mr. Law. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Let me, let me make sure that we have our principal, Yvonne Rodriguez, come and talk to you for a minute. As I mentioned to you, not only are we bringing you tonight safety information, but also a celebratory presentation of the wonderful world of career technical education. Wonderful. Dr. Rodriguez represents that program, uh, the, the medical assistant program, and Dr. Francois later on will present all the strengths. When I told Yvonne that I wanted to showcase her medical assistance, she looked both panicked and happy at the same time. <laughs> One, that we had to present in front of the board, but two, as some of you have said, we want to begin to recognize new programs, yes. uh, programs that bring incredible results for our students. So I mentioned to Yvonne, let, let's talk for a minute about this program since they're assisting us so well. So Yvonne, with all that, it's all yours. Thank you. Good evening. I want to thank uh, Board President Yesenia Corenta, Board Vice President Sonia De Leon, Superintendent Ruben Frutos, and members of the board for allowing us to highlight the work of the Paramount Adult School Medical Assistant Program. Our mission as part of the Tri-City Consortium is we connect education and workforce training to create family-sustaining careers. And our medical assistant program changes the lives of our adult students and their families. The medical system program has been at Paramount Adult School since 2012. There are 62 students presently enrolled, students like Susana Baragon and Yosana Grano, who we met earlier this evening, enter a six-month program where they learn physiology and anatomy, 
medical law and ethics, medical terminology, medical coding, front office and back office. Theirs is a condensed program, whereas the high school students receive their instruction over years. Once students have completed their four modules offered, they enter an externship program and complete 160 hours. At the end of the program, our students are ready to work in a clinical setting, including medical offices and urgent care facilities. We are proud of our adult school students who take on the challenge of coming back to school to pursue their goal of entering the medical field. According to Ms. Laura Galvan, the instructor who has helped shape the adult school program, adult learners are more dedicated, work harder, and are focused on reaching their life goals. She is most proud of how quickly they become students and adapt to the material. Moreover, it should be noted that our ESL students are making it through the program. We heard at our 2021 graduation, student speaker Maria Perez shared how she began her journey at PAS as an ESL learner and went on to earn her high school equivalency certificate and then completed the medical assistant program, all of which was inspired by seeing her son go through the medical assistant program at the high school. Maria is not the first nor the last ESL student to accomplish this. We at this time cannot be prouder than having our adult students serve the district by assisting in the COVID testing process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. I appreciate it. So that's one. You'll hear about all of them in a few minutes, but back to safety. So Scott, you're back. All right. Let's try this again. Next slide, please. We also have some support coming to us very soon through two different companies that we're partnering with. One is named PubSeg, and what they will help us with is contact tracing. So you can imagine if we have one positive case in a classroom, how many phone calls have to be made very quickly to decide whether we need to quarantine or not. Um, this company is going to come in and be able to work seven days a week for us to make those phone calls and help us decide very quickly. It just added manpower to a very labor intensive uh, chore. The other partner that we're starting with, hopefully, as I mentioned earlier, in about two weeks, will be COVID Clinic. And COVID Clinic is currently testing our athletes, uh, once a week testing for our athletes. And we're going to expand them, hopefully, to three different sites throughout the district. And those sites will be manned so that staff can go once a week and get a test for free. And these are the staff that are opting in. And we're trying to spread them out across the district so that staff won't have to drive too far. Mm -hmm. It'll be on different days at each site. So it, hopefully we'll make it as convenient as possible. And again, that, we're hoping to get that up and running in about two weeks. Is that for both, Mr. Law, the up, up and running uh, two weeks? Uh, PubSeg looks like uh, second week in November. COVID Clinic looks like probably first week in November, maybe into the second. But we're real close on both of them. Thank you. Uh huh. Next slide, please. So taking to a different subject here slightly was our vaccination program. And we have uh, some in the history and some that's current. So we'll start with the history. March 21, um, the, 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 the vaccinations rolled out to, to most teachers. And uh, Superintendent Frutos at the time was you know, in charge of the business office, Frutos. But we were able to get some nice partnerships with his help through uh, community college, Compton Community College. Uh, our local clinics, one is the Paramount Pharmacy just down the street a little bit. They've been really helpful to us. Whittier Hospital are just a few of them uh, that we were able to partner with. And at the time, they gave us codes. We had a small allocation of codes. And so we would hit the phones and the emails and contact all of our staff and say, who's next? Who wants to go? Through that process, we had 768 of our employees go get vaccinated. Um, I know they got the first vaccine, but I don't know if they got the second one because then they made the arrangements through um, the hospital or the clinic that they mm -hmm. went to. Um, I, I would hope that they finished it off. So currently between uh, our efforts and then our staff went and got their own from their own doctor or their own clinic or what, wherever they went to, we're currently at 1,558 employees that are vaccinated. Next slide. Starting in June, uh, we took that partnership we had with uh, Paramount Pharmacy and uh, parlayed it with uh, LA County Health and Jefferson School and our own staff. And we were able to open up a COVID vaccination clinic every Friday. 
to take that back. We've missed a few Fridays here and there, Fourth of July and things like that. But most Fridays we've been there from four to eight. And you know, we're really excited because we advertise to our students and our staff, but it's open to the community. And so we had lots of people come that felt comfortable coming to a school, mm -hmm. more comfortable coming to a school and getting vaccinated. Because yes. it's a really, it's a, it's a low key, no stress. Mm -hmm. and, and we've now given 1,589 vaccines uh, so far. And so that's to our community. A lot of our students, but just a lot of the people living in the neighborhood. It's been nice. Mm -hmm. Next slide. There's a, there's a picture of it. You know, nice. I don't take pictures of people getting shots. I don't think they'd appreciate <laughs> that. So this is right before we open the door. But that's, nice. Jeff that's Jefferson's NPR. And Very nice. We got, uh, we're all set up with the technology and the stations. And, and it's a, it's a well-oiled machine now. We've, we've had a lot of practice. So next slide. Yes, for sure. We, st we started last week with booster shots, oh, uh, and we're gonna, we advertised it last week. Uh, we didn't see as big a turnout, so I'm hoping that it catches on, and we are, we've now committed to at least another two months because we think the student vaccines are going to become available for the younger ones, and so we've, we've, we're going to go through December at least. Uh, the, the partnership with Paramount Pharmacy has been easy and wonderful and they're happy to do it and we're happy to have okay. them so there's no, no one telling us to stop okay. it's been it's been a nice program on to uh, quarantine guidelines here so when we have a positive case um, there are some steps that we go through when we're doing that contact tracing to decide whether we need to quarantine whether an individual a staff member a student a whole class you know these are the steps that we're following and really it falls into two categories if you're exposed but you're fully vaccinated, you don't necessarily have to quarantine. You need to you know, watch yourself and see if you develop symptoms, um, but you're able to, to avoid the quarantine. If you're unvaccinated, then you do quarantine and you need to, you know, you'll either have a negative response or a positive response, and then we adjust the quarantine time based on that. But really, that's the, at this point, that's sort of the deciding factor. And this has been publicized out to teachers and staff and principals and everything else. And the next slide, if you wouldn't mind. I'd like, oh, to, make, sorry, I'd like to make a comment on this mm -hmm. slide. Um, we, we, we received today from Isela a, a magnet showing um, the symptoms. Mm -hmm. It would be really nice to have a magnet sent home to the parents on this. They could put it on the refrigerator, both in English and Spanish. You know, if they I mean, because we have both magnets. Because usually you put stuff on your refrigerator and you can see. And this is a type of, of, of I believe that the parents sometimes forget and we don't go back to the website or we don't go back to the paperwork, the paperwork gets lost. Mm -hmm. But if it was a magnet, I think it would, it would, be, it would be helpful. Thank you for that suggestion. That will, we will take that in consideration. Um, next slide, if you wouldn't mind. Next slide, if you wouldn't mind. It's okay, sorry. Excellent. This is also a graphic that's been around for a while. We've shared with teachers, staff, principals, every, everybody. Um, it is also similar information, but this one's out there at the schools and stuff, so I wanted to share it. Um, I think that number five on this step is, is uh, what's important for this graphic is at the end of contact tracing and at the end of deciding who's quarantined and who's not and all that, we also send out um, information to all the staff and all the families at the school because there was an exposure at their school even though if it wasn't close contact they still get a notification and i know that we're well past that now but in the beginning there was lots of confusion oh there's a case there's a case and it's the difference between a close contact and just a case at the site and so but we still do i mean we still need to do that every time there's a case mm -hmm. next slide So we meet, I, I know that you know about the, the BTS, the back to school team, and, and that, that served its for, uh, purpose, and that was a large committee, and we worked very, very hard on that committee to get ready to open the doors, and the doors have been open for a while now. And so now that BTS is sort of morphed into a smaller, more for, focused committee called the COVID Compliance Team. It has a different purpose, really. We're monitoring all the updates from the state, all the updates from LA County Health, which I'm not exaggerating, change weekly. Um, and we monitor those and we adjust our practices and our protocols to fit them. And so 
In this case, you have um, this last time we met, and Myrna is the lead of, of this team, and there's principals and teachers and special ed, and it's a, it's a nice cross-section, but it's a very focused team. Um, we looked at our district's COVID plan and made adjustments to what needed to be adjusted, and we looked at all the um, California and, and LA County Health Department guidelines. There's an appendix that's put out, Appendix T1, that seems to change often. Those are, that's sort of our guidebook, our rules, and we have to adhere to those. And they do change, and so we made those appropriate changes here. If you go to a school, you'll see it in the front office, and you'll probably see it in some of the classrooms. It's posted um, right up front. We decided about the magnets, and so you mm -hmm. saw the magnets tonight. We, mm -hmm. made, we made a lot of magnets, and uh, we sent those home with all the kids after oh, this last okay, meeting. And, home. Yeah, and sure. so the, the magnets were a hit. They went home, and I'm sure they're on lots of people's refrigerators holding up the lunch menu, I'm <laughs> sure. So. Uh, we emphasized how vaccines were very important to getting us out of this COVID uh, predicament. And so that's, that got put into the messaging from this committee. And then we also changed some of the language to say that there is variation from site to site. Some of the procedures are, are non-negotiables. We have to do some things. And some things are good practice if we can do that. Uh, and so it, that has a lot to do. I'll give you the, the easiest example that we actually talked about in this committee was, if I happen to be lucky to have a gigantic room, I, I, you know, I have a huge room this size, well, spreading my students out is a good practice. And I can because I have a giant room. But if I have a very, very small room, then I do the very best I can. But they might not be eight feet apart. They might be four feet apart. But at this point, um, we left some flexibility in there on the things that we could. Next slide. New topic again. Uh, I th over the last couple board meetings, there's been a series of approvals of, of HVAC systems and specifically filtration. Uh, we went out to bid and then the bid results came in and then thankfully you all approved those bid results and we've moved forward with actually the procurement of the materials we need and we're starting the last of our schools that have MERV 13 which is which is excellent filtration but we're, we're upping it even more to MERV 16 and I believe that work if the materials start to come in here I think we'll be starting uh, October 30th? No, October 29th. So the end of this month, we're hoping to be at our first school. And it takes, you know, a couple weeks per school to retrofit and then put the new filter in. But that's, that's on the uh, horizon here. And as soon as that work is done, every, every HVAC in the whole district will be MERV 16, no matter, uh, you know, where it's at. Classroom, storeroom, district office, it's all MERV 16. What you're seeing there is, I, I double dutied on this one. That's brand new uh, HVAC there at Odyssey. That's their two uh, new science labs there. And the things that look like missiles kind of on the roof, mm -hmm. those are actually a really uh, fancy filtration system for their chemistry hoods. And so if they do chemistry experiments, it's all, it cools the vapors, it filters the vapors. It's a very fancy setup there to make sure that we're being safe for the environment. Next slide. PPE. All classrooms uh, have PPE. Uh, there's, there's available to the staff, it's available to the students. It's regularly refreshed. The schools all have a stockpile so that if they run out and you know we can't get it to them that minute, they have a stockpile. The picture you see there is Buena Vista stockpile. So you can see Buena Vista has 20-ish rooms, something like that, and that's their stockpile of PPE. So th it's ample. Um, Sites can ask for PPE, and we usually get it to them in a day, but we also do our own checks. m and goes through and does their own checks, and if we see they're short or anything, we add to it. Um, once PPE was distributed to sites, uh, we had some special requests for just different situations. Speech teachers wanted to have masks that had a clear face piece on it so they could see um, them speaking in speech class. That seems to make sense. And so some of this, the specialized equipment uh, was ordered as soon as we could and, and as soon as it got here we got it out to sites and, and now it's maintained the same way as anything else. If they need more, they let us know we need more see-through or more full gowns or more face shields and, and we get it. We have a pretty large store room of it in the warehouse also. So Mr. Law, who is, mm -hmm. the, who is the one that um, 
ask for it with the teacher or does it go through the principal or does it go to somebody who so that we so that we can track it and make sure we don't uh, miss anybody along the way we treat it as a work order um, because it's a system that's in place that everyone has access to and so a work order is put in that I need you know uh, mm -hmm. 10 more boxes of gowns and then work orders are picked up and so if it's late in the day it would be the next morning if it's in the morning it's usually the same day we, we drive it over the warehouse does the uh, delivery so it, it, the teachers wouldn't email directly they would contact their principal their assistant principal or the office but all those people have access to our, our work order system thank you mm -hmm. but and it, it allows but it allows us to I'm sorry I'm sorry it allows us to um, maintain inventory too because our work order system allows us to track our inventory but I, I, it, but at all times there is some there they oh, don't yeah. let it go to where there is it's no, nothing no and we okay. have and like I said we have we have store I mean we have extra stock so we have the classroom bins and right. stuff we have extra stock which is in that picture that it's point of vistas mm -hmm. and then we also have a whole storeroom full of it at the warehouse too okay and so unless it's a really odd request you know like when we first wanted the see-through masks not that it was odd it's just that it was specialized and so it took a little while to get here but it's here now and we have we have extras and so I'm glad to hear that you yeah. stated that we have extra stock <laughs> because of the supply chain shortage in the state that so is an good. issue yes. yes thank you next slide so these are just some catch-alls they didn't deserve a whole slide to themselves but I wanted to I wanted to call them out our health rooms are being you know regularly cleaned and maintained and you see a picture over there on the side health rooms are separate from our sick room so you know a student comes in and says um, I don't know my toe hurts I, I, I need a band-aid that, that sort of thing we all know what that looks like in an elementary school especially uh, but we have quarantine rooms or health rooms that are separate and that's a that's a picture of one there that's you know we have a sign ready to go on the inside that's huge that we put right in front of the door so no one wanders in we have specialized PPE in there um, we have lots of anything you could think of that we need for a quarantine room is in that room um, and so every site has that and they unfortunately they're in there quite a bit it's getting better and better though so. uh, signage throughout campus so you see one sign there for the quarantine room but if you go to any of the campus you see it all over the place and we early on um, made nice signage that all matches it's it's cohesive it really tells the st story of that we're ready for uh, you know covid prevention and if you go to any site you'll see it i don't need to describe it too much to you um, two new things newish things uh, we'll start with the grab and go breakfast we started that for the beginning of the year and i think you've been had a wednesday update or two about that but basically that allows us to uh, give the kids their breakfast from the next morning as they leave school. So Monday afternoon as they walk out of campus, they get handed a bag, and that's their breakfast for Tuesday morning. And it allows us not to have to have kids too close with masks <laughs> off. It, it's, it's the best we could uh, do at the time. And we're constantly evaluating if that's still um, a good idea or what, what, if we're moving away from that or going to keep it for a while. It's currently still in place. And I think the newest thing we did was outdoor eating. If you drive around campuses, if you, on your way home, go by the front of Lincoln where the bell is on the corner there, you'll see a, um, looks like we're having a wedding in the lawn. And, uh, but that's, that's more outside seating. We've provided lots of bench seating, outdoor eating tables, canopies, and because it was gonna rain now, all those canopies suddenly have sides on them. We did that over the weekend. Um, rush rush over the weekend because we thought the rain could be really mm -hmm. bad and we wanted to provide an, uh, an ability to still eat outside if it wasn't awful so. that concludes my portion of tonight um, I'd like to turn over to Mr. Frutos if unless there is any questions specifically for what you've heard I do have a couple questions one um, you had said that the new team that um, make sure that they're following mm -hmm. the updates which change mm -hmm. weekly how does that team uh, collaborate or um, inform the rest of the staff per se students and parents um, is there something that the parents are um, looking up is it information how is it that being done so the team is is there to look and set in place protocols and then those protocols are shared out with the site and then the site shares them out with their their students their teachers their everything 
Um, it's a smaller team. We're not doing large meetings with all of Paramount, but we, we do meet then, the information then flows back to the admin and the admin out to their site. And Scott, I can add, uh, Vice President De Leon, that in some cases when the news are uh, novel or important, like mm -hmm. when we announced that we were going to start testing, we actually send an email to all staff to make sure that they understand that something new will be happening and that way in conjunction with the teams, they get a message from the superintendent's mm -hmm. office saying this is something yeah. that you need to know. And by and large, we've received a lot of responses saying thank you for the messages from the sites and for getting emails. And as you know, with the parents, there have been a couple of occasions when we want to set information. And I think in some cases, they've been done on paper with the nutrition services meals. Do you want to mention those? Sure. Um, many of our advertisements and, and policy changes and our vaccine clinics and you know a lot of the stuff we advertise, we, we send it out obviously on those auto dialers. Um, but some people hang up on the auto dialer, so we also do it on paper, and we send it with the lunches, uh, excuse me, with the to-go breakfast. And so uh, those go out as little reminders. If it's something that really we want to advertise to everybody, 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 then we'll do the paper and we'll do the all call. Um, but we try to we try to not do the all call. I don't know if any. Lives in Long Beach. We get six a night uh, from Long Beach <laughs> Unified. We try we try not to do that to people. So. That's a good question from Vice President yeah. De Leon because we want to continue to communicate with our community as quickly mm -hmm. as we get news. This new vaccination will be a test of that yes. because once it's approved, we are going to need to communicate to everyone that there's a new age group that will be allowed to mm -hmm. be vaccinated. Yeah, I think that would require a whole blitz of everything we can to get the word out. Scott, then, Scott, you said that there was 509 staff um, that were te with that had was testing. Um, what mm -hmm. last? Yes, mandatorily last tested. Uh, are, are those the only amount of um, of uh, staff uh, staff members that have not had their vaccine? It falls. And then, into, how yeah. are we keeping track of that? Sure. It falls into two categories. We have we have some staff that has um, stated that they did not get the vaccine and that they, they would like to do the weekly testing instead. Uh -huh. So we have, we have that group of people. We have a group of people who um, have not said if they had the vaccine or not. They're choosing not to tell us that, or they haven't told us that. But either way, those people fall into a group that still needs to be tested weekly. So whether we've heard from you or we've heard from you that if you're not vaccinated, either way, you need to be weekly tested, and that adds up to that 509. Okay, and, and so that, and so actually, in actuality, 509 are the only ones that have not been vaccinated, yes. as yes. far as you know. Yes. So three quarters of our total staff has been vaccinated. Okay. And when I say total staff, I, I mean every, every person that gets a paycheck is, is on our staff list. Okay. And HR is tracking that. Um, they are? Yes. So HR is, is in charge of all the vaccination verifications. Myrna spends a lot of time to actually double check all those. We built a, a way that staff could submit um, a form and it went directly to HR so then then their their information could be reviewed that it was correct and then they're checked off that they've been vaccinated okay. My, yeah I have two more questions sure a uh, really quick with on slide 13 um, you talked about the HEPA filters mm -hmm. um, and I my question is do we have the HEPA uh, filters besides the MRF 13s and the MRF 16s are those HEPA filters, are they being replaced with the HEPA filters? Yes, absolutely. We bought a two-year supply already, so that, that's all we have in supply to replace them is the HEPA filtration. So, so then, it's a three, it's a, I'm sorry. So, so then, because I, I know there was um, a concern, a few teachers had addressed me, mm -hmm. um, and I, I haven't addressed Mr. Futos. I know the, I told them about the DA um, possibly providing us with a, uh, the HIPAA filters, mm -hmm. um, but there were some teachers stating that the Aeromax machines that we got from, that were donated from us, mm -hmm. for us from the gas company, mm -hmm. they haven't been replaced. So if we could look into that. I will. We, 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 uh, we double checked all of them before we rolled them out, and we only had about 250 left of the donated ones, so all the rest is new. So, you know. 600 brand new units that came with HEPA. 
Um, I think the little confusion might be if you look inside, it looks like there's a carbon filter in there. It's the way the filter is set up. It's, it's a very robust filtration system, and so it has a little pre-screen, and then it has a carbon filter, and then it has a true thick help of HEPA filter at the back end of it. So if you just peek in there, you see carbon, and there was a little confusion on one site that thought that they didn't have the right thing, but they just didn't understand how it worked. Oh, okay. So. And then my last question, because I know this is uh, something new, the grab-and-go breakfast. Yes. So as a parent, I'm thinking um, my child is getting their breakfast a day before, correct? Yes. So then what does breakfast look like? Um, is it something that has to be stored in the fridge? Do they have to warm it up? What's... I think I would have to get back to you on a Wednesday update because I don't want to misspeak on that, what's actually in there, each one. There are some things that have to get refrigerated, but then there's other things like um, maybe a blueberry muffin or a Mexican bread, concha, um, um, the uh, little toaster, things that you put in the toaster, those you don't have to refrigerate. Other things that do are maybe a breakfast burrito. Um, they get maybe fruit cups. And I, I know this because of my granddaughter. She brings mm -hmm. it to the house every, every day after school. Um, their milk has to get refrigerated. And the burritos. Uh, sometimes they have, like, some tacos. Tacos that, with the fillings in the baggie. And, and um, that would have to get refrigerated. To okay. facilitate the information, if it's okay, Scott, That's we'll okay. send uh, the entire board a menu. Uh, Lucy, who's here, I saw her earlier on somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, she's not anymore. Um, she will send a menu for an entire time so that the board sees all the different items that are sent home. That oh. might be the easiest. Okay, so then parents are, would be aware that there's things that need to be refrigerated because I know there's children. I, I've had boys and they don't clean their backpacks or they, you know, they forget. Um, so the parents would know to look in their backpacks per se and, and know that there's stuff that needs to be refrigerated. Yes, that, or that was they, or, communicated at the beginning of the, the program. Yes. Or they need, like, help. They need someone to help them uh, either toast something or put it in the microwave. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, yeah, you, you would warm it in the Well, most parents would warm it in the microwave. And... I'm just asking because I know uh, we have a community that it's a working community, and typically they drop their children off and the cafeteria um, personnel does all the warming up and they just have a hot meal and they don't have to worry about their, you know, their parents are off to work. So I'm just interested in know how well this program is working. Uh, um, and if we could get like an update from the families um, and the students, I would say importantly, the students, um, are they liking this? Are they liking um, food that has to be refrigerated then warmed up the next day? When did we start the breakfast? Uh, since the, the start of school. Yeah. So, okay, so if we haven't heard any complaints from parents. We've had a couple, we like we do every few. year, when one or two items either um, are, you know, have failed. Every yes. once in a while there's an item that, that uh, either opens up. But by and large, folks have said that they have uh, enjoyed having the meals. But what we'll do, we'll, we'll do a Wednesday do a report survey. from, from nutrition school. services. Have, That's yeah, a good idea. Survey. Yeah, and I'm not yeah. looking at to say I'm being negative. I'm no. just, we know it, w it would be nice to have a consensus of how's it going, because mm -hmm. if it's something that is going well, then we could continue. If it's something that it's not, then, mm -hmm. then we need to update how we feed our students. No, it's a good question. We'll be happy to provide a report to the board. Yeah, it's okay. good to check. Thank you. I have one last question, and that is regarding the callback, you know, to call it the homes when something's mm -hmm. urgent. I know most everyone has a cell phone. Mm -hmm. I think we need to start using cell phones and a link because everybody's on their cell phone. If there was a cell phone from PUSD and with a link, I know they click on the link and that information should be there. So I think we need to look, look outside the box instead of just sending a paper home or just doing the, the, the robocall. And we, we can send out texts. Um, it, it just relies on if we have people's cell phone mm -hmm. numbers. Absolutely, so. but I mean, most people now do have. That, that, there's rarely people that now have home phones because everybody has a cell that phone. They, have, they also yeah, have those free phones, so. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And I'll turn sir. it back to you. I appreciate, I appreciate Thank it. You, Mr. Thank you. Mr. And as I mentioned to you, tonight was supposed to be a, a, a report on safety, but we are going to add to you, in light of our medical students that are here, how the CTE program works. Uh, uh, you have Dr. Francois, who will be uh, introducing the program. I did want to mention to you that you, the board, have allowed currently 10 pathways to exist. If you think about it, that's 10 career choices for our students. We're very happy to tell you that we're calling them 11 because the team has been working very hard on programming for um, online game design, what they call eSports. So tonight when you hear 11 pathways, it's absolutely true. The 11th is coming and it's part of the approvals that you will be doing at the November meeting. So with them, I'm going to turn it over to both of you. Go ahead and do some introductions. If you don't mind, Greg, and it's all yours. Thank you so much. And as we begin, I first wanted to say thank you. Thank you for your continual support of providing these life-changing experiences and programs for our community. As you think about in our generation and our generation before, it, when you went to school, it was either you're getting prepared for college or you're on the career track. And the great thing about CTE is preparing our students for both. So for tonight, we're just gonna just give an overview, a snapshot of what CT looks like in our community. And I'd like to start off with introducing our, our, my new colleague, and thank you for support, and thank you also, Paramount Park, for allowing her to, to join us, is Grace Yu. So you've seen her picture on our website, you've seen her picture on our posters. She's our reigning district teacher of the year. Yay. And she started off strong, so very happy to have her on the team. And she's, she's going to start us off with, an, with a snapshot of our current pathways. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Francois. Uh, good evening. I'm very excited and fortunate to join this team as I continue to serve our students. Uh, this year, for our career and technical education, we are offering 11 pathways, like what Mr. Fruto said earlier, and four of which are from our Project Lead the Way um, program and w this is a great uh, program where you will see a vertical articulation starting with our middle school where we offer schools the option of six different project lead the way courses and it is revolving and schools get to choose which ones they would like to have students engage in and so when they go to the high school they will be able to interact with the architectural design pathway the biomedical science pathway the computer science pathway, and down at that number six, our engineer design pathway. So aside from those, we also offer the design and visual and media arts pathway. Uh, number five, education, child development, and family services. I'm excited to share with you that I'm working with Ms. Mai this year with our newest course within that pathway. Uh, we have our number seven, entrepreneurship, number nine, our food and services, hospitality, patient care, sports medicine, and the most exciting one for us coming January is our newest eSports game design. By the way, you, before you continue, board members, we didn't want to embarrass Ms. Yu, but uh, uh, Ms. Martinez and I had the opportunity to go to her Teacher of the Year celebration where they were treated like movie stars. And I said that before her presentation, maybe she would have been nervous, but it's a wonderful addition to the team, yes. Dr. Franz. Yes, thank you. Thank you, next slide. So with this slide, I was going to just highlight a few facts just to get a, just a synopsis, what does CT look like, feel like? And so one of the things you may not realize, five of the last six PHS valedictorians completed at least one CT pathway. So this is really unique because um, in 2008 and 2009, when I was at PHS doing the master schedule, at that time we had ROP and just starting with CTE, and it was difficult to get students to take the courses because they said, yes, I'm interested in that, but it's not A through G, it's not college prep. And so at this point, when, when I started in this, in this role in 2014, 35% of our courses in CTE were UC A through G approved. And so we worked really hard. So from 2017 on, 100% of our courses in CTE are UC A through G approved. And so they're really beneficial for all kids to prepare them for college and career. 
We currently have seven courses articulated with Cerritos College with two pending. What that means is our agreement shows if students earn a grade of C or higher, they get college credit while they're still in high school, which is pretty amazing. More than 2,000 students will take a CT course each and every day. Our three-year trend has been 2,310 students will take at least one course during the day of CTE, with the three-year average 194 special ed students being a part of that, that cohort group as well. So once again, being good for all students. Mm -hmm. So when you walk into a classroom, you will notice it doesn't look like a traditional classroom, and it should not. CT courses should have industry standard facilities, equipment, and supplies. It also, you're gonna see a few highlights in just a few minutes with pictures highlighting work-based learning for students to highlight and, and practice their, their skills. Real world application, as you saw here tonight with the brave Scott Law. <laughs> Hands-on learning, um, industry <laughs> partnerships to provide mentorship, um, field trip experiences, you name it and also include an annual CT advisory committee where we bring experts and at least once per year to do a deep dive in our program. Are we preparing our students for the world of work? Are we preparing them to earn jobs and so on? And we surveyed them. What are some skills that you feel are definite need in, in, your, in your role? And then we come back to the drama with our team to make sure our programs are preparing students with those skills. Link learning, project-based learning, and once again, preparing the kids for 21st century skills. Someone might say, well, what is linked learning? So I want you to imagine this. Imagine that you are a ninth grade student and you're, you're passionate about culinary arts. You sign up and you get that class, how excited you are. What does it do to your motivation when you go to your math class and it's, it's not totally traditional concepts, but there's a lot more units on measurement and ratios, and you go to your history class and they're talking about cuisines of the world, what grows here, what grows there, right? So linked mm -hmm. learning has provided an opportunity for us to have um, cross-curriculum yes. collaboration with math teachers, social studies teachers, language arts, and so on. So it's been a great thing and that's one of our things that we're gonna continue to grow is, is our linked learning. Next slide. And so here you see a few glimpses of CTE at work. So on the left top, there's a picture of a PHS student mm -hmm. patient care leading a vital signs workshop with a student from Alondra that we brought over. So the student was taking our medical detectives class at Alondra, so we bring them over for an experience that the students facilitate. So it's hands-on, so it's one thing to read about, the parts of the body, it's another thing to construct it by hand with clay, with three foot tall models with that. And it's also a family. And that's one thing that you'll see consistently with CTE is we have rock star teachers that connect well with kids. And the thing about it is about half of them, we hired them from industry and taught them how to be teachers, which is, which is really phenomenal. They come in as experts. We also see students in that bottom right volunteering for the LA AIDS walk as they do at every Paramount event that we would have locally. We always have a team there. Next slide. This right here is a, is a great example of vertical articulation, vertical articulation at work. So this is also a day where we, we sort of scare the Alondra kids, not on purpose, but we had the students to put a real life scenario of wow. a patient being down. And so, code red, code red, and the student teams get to their stations and start uh, applying CPR, checking. When a student gets tired, they rotate. And this is an example of real world equipment. This is an Apollo mannequin. We have two of them. These are examples of technology that you will see in a medical school at the college level, preparing students for going into patient care. And we have two of them here. With the support of you all and the CT Incentive Grant and support with our LCAP, we are able to provide some amazing equipment that's going to help save lives down the road. And so this Apollo mannequin can talk, he can bleed, he breathes, um, and as you get close enough, he blinks. So it doesn't get any realer than this. Next slide. 
So this highlights another, another realm of experiences for our students. So you see on the bottom left are our young femineers. So this is the femineers program that you've, you've heard about. And so we have this at four of our middle schools. And I started this role, we looked at the number of females that were continuing, that were finishing the, edu the engineering pathway as seniors. And at that year, there were two. And we looked at the data starting off in ninth grade, it was almost 50-50. So we looked at what are some ways that we can capture our, our young ladies' interests, um, get them still excited about STEM and going to our, our pathways, working on that equity. And Feminears has been an amazing, amazing addition to our, our PUSD family. And so here you'll see young ladies sometimes for the first time working, having tools in their hands, mm -hmm. building. And that first year is about wearable technology. And for those out there wearing Apple Watches, this example of wearable technology that we get a chance to see. So entrepreneurship was, was, was huge. Um, we've been in that pathway of going on about four years. And our rock star teacher came from, she was a secretary in the office at PHS. Mm. Just by talking, getting a chance that she, she had a background in business and, and she's like, me a teacher? And she's one of our strongest right now. So having that, having that, that belief in, in kids is, is phenomenal. The upper right, there's a, a young man, his name Jalen Griffin. He was our first student to advance in national competition from PHS. And on the bottom, you see Ulyssa Revelis, who competed nationally. She made the finals last year. So this is an international competition. So just really, really um, proud of Ulyssa and the team that, that worked with her, prepare her. She finished nationally, well, internationally second in a entre young entrepreneurship competition this past mm -hmm. year. So when we say life-changing uh, work and mm -hmm. programs, these are our prime examples. It's really giving our students hope and excitement, and many of them, that why, why do I come to school each day? This is one of the, one of the answers. Next slide. And also with competitions, our culinary arts students have, have uh, participated in numerous uh, competitions and are winning for the first annual um, Cerritos College youth competition. Our student won the first one, left with a thousand dollar check. Um, it was really awesome seeing the leadership firsthand up there explaining their dish and why they chose this, this and that. And for those of you who go to the LA County Fair, as you go into those exhibits with photography, nine times out of ten you're going to see PHS mm -hmm. students work up there with ribbons. We, we won, we placed each year we've, we've entered. So what's next? So one of the things that we piloted this year with the board support are CT enrichment courses. We piloted a business camp for our young entrepreneurs. And so for next summer, we'd like to expand on that and offer CT enrichment courses in all of our, our, our pathways. Our team that's taken a lead has been our culinary arts, and we started working with them this past summer to develop the curriculum for, for next summer using project-based learning. And so what a great opportunity to do some amazing units that they're not able to get to during a year and also capture student interest. One being working uh, a full course on chocolates, mm -hmm. just on sugars, you know, especially um, desserts and so on. And our media is excited and fired up, a great way to introduce students to CT with courses like animation. So we're really excited for this upcoming summer to expand our enrichment course options um, also, we're looking to continue to expand courses in our existing pathways. Our biomedical science pathway is in a second year. It's a two-year of a four-year pathway. So we're already looking to the year three, continuing with what they need for that. And one of the special tools that they're utilizing that is that anatomage table that we, we shared with you in an update recently, the world's first 3D human dissection table. So real-world application um, at its finest for our, for our kids. We talked about linked learning, and we're really fired up to, to bring eSports game design, one of the most popular, fastest growing career options um, that we'll see. Um, and so we're excited to, to bring it to PHS. We'll launch the first course the second semester through our partnership of Cal Apps. And then next year, our, our plan is to offer it um, during sixth period as well as after school um, at, at PHS. So very fired up and, and excited to continue the, the world of CTE. Um, I've seen it firsthand. It's, it's, it's changing lives and giving our kids hope, mm -hmm. preparing them for college and career. Thank you.
Thank you. Sorry, I just have a couple questions, uh, very minor, but I noticed um, you mentioned on um, slide number right here, the one with the one with the um, the one that stated that we have the um, stakeholders. I believe it is. Are they called stakeholders? No, they're called the advisory committee. Uh, no, no, no. Um, I should have stopped when I wanted to stop, um, but I didn't want to. No, right here when you said um oh the industrial partners partnership how many industrial partnerships do we have and how are we looking for more we we have several and the, the goal is to have at least uh, at least uh, more than one in, in every pathway and so in a couple months you'll be presented with a, a, a list of our ct advisory committee and i will outline all of the different pathways so that's coming uh very soon uh, our industry partners will host students for internships, some paid, some unpaid. Some will host for, for um, mentorship. Uh, Long Beach Search and, Search and Rescue is, is one of our partners. Paramount Publishing, they host interns, one of our partners. Um, Kaiser, we place students at Kaiser. So it's, it's an extensive list. And with, like I said, the goal is to continue to grow those partnerships. We've partnered with the Paramount Chamber of Commerce looking at local businesses. Some have been through word of mouth, through staff. Um, we reach out to you know, uh, various businesses as, as well. Um, but probably, I think the January meeting, we, we will bring forth the CT Advisory Committee with the breakdown of the, the current partnerships that we have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And my, my last question is, um, you mentioned we have seven courses articulated in, in Cerritos College. Do we have any in Long Beach City College? And I know we do, we do have some in Compton College, but Long Beach City? So in, in, in terms of the, the geographic lo locations, um, we've been reminded that Compton College is our home district mm -hmm. and that we must start with there and then get their permission to work with others. Mm -hmm. And so Cerritos College um, has, has been our partner for that because Compton cannot um, articulate courses with us. And so at this time, we've, we've only had permission to work with Cerritos College for those articulated agreements. I, I, I understand that Compton is our district, but I think we need to really talk to them because not everybody wants to go to Compton or Cerritos. Long Beach is right around the corner, up the street on Clark. I think we, we, we should expand our opportunities there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, board members. Any other questions? As we promised you, the goal tonight was to give you uh, an update. Thank you, Dr. Thank Francois. You, Dr. Thank Francois. you, Ms. Yu. Uh, we wanted to give you an update on safety and much more. Uh, even though the pandemic continues, we wanted to remind the board and our community that this is an amazing educational institution. What better way to showcase it when we show you that students are getting trained for college and career mm -hmm. in a variety of strengths? And how innovative. Game design is one of those industries that's growing like you cannot believe, and here we will have it as well as many other traditional careers that are highly paid. So part of our goal is to continue to bring you uh, information about what's going on with this pandemic that it seems will not go away for a while, but at the same time showcase the successes of our educational teams that are doing really well in a pandemic. Sure. So with that, if you have questions, we're happy to entertain them. Otherwise, our goal is to bring you a strong update once we get information on this new vaccination for our youngest uh, uh, students. We will bring you that as soon as we get it from the health department. And as uh, brave Mr. Law, who just offered you his <laughs> life in front of you and, and, and all that, we will continue to uh, update our entire community because uh, we know that this new FDA approvals will cause a, an enormous mm -hmm. amount of confusion to our to yes. our families and we want to provide them information before we move forward with those services. Um, if there are no other questions, we'll conclude tonight. I hope you found it informative. Mr. Uh, Ferutas, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, staff coming before the board and showcasing the wonderful programs that are happening in our school district. And I would like to continue to have you um, have um, various staff members come before us and to share what's happening at their school showcase because we do have a wonderful district and like Mr. Francois stated, um, we are preparing our students 
her college and career. So I want to thank the presentations tonight. They were excellent. Thank you so much. I, I, I also did all that, but I also I would like another study session, but on safety um, in general, so safety at our high schools, safety at our middle schools, and safety in our elementary schools, if we can have another another study session in the future, probably next month or the month after. Um, I'd appreciate that. Is Jesse going to be showing that at our next meeting? From the safety the we, we will we actually present some committee. information at an upcoming meeting and then if after that the board feels that there's a need for a study session we'll be happy to plan yeah Absolutely. that was a great uh, safety meeting and everything that jesse showed us was Absolutely. amazing thank you regarding that safety meeting i'm still i'm still waiting for my minutes because i've asked for the minutes i wasn't able to attend um i had a, a, another yeah work, I, they said that you didn't make it I, we'll get, you can get absolutely thank you uh, one one final thing board members uh, as we if, if there's a way that the board could stay a couple of minutes I do have a couple of announcements for you and including an announcement for the next training that we have on the Brown Act we will be able to host it here for those of you that are interested so if there's nothing else we thank the students again thank you very yeah, much for you. for the thank amazing you. Thank work you so much. Thank and you. have thank a good you. night thank you it's what yeah, this is so yummy, Linda. I love it. It is now 7.11 p.m. And we will adjourn this meeting. May I get a motion? Motion to adjourn. May I get a second? Second. Thank you. Isela, will you call roll, please? Governing Board Member Garcia? Yes. Governing Board Member Gomez? Yes. Governing Board Member Martinez? Yes. Governing Board Member DeLeon? Yes. Governing Board Member Cuarenta. Yes. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.